So first of all, let me thank the organizers for the invitation to this workshop. And yeah, I have a similar problem to Martina in that they invited all my co-authors as well, which kind of, and, and one of them to give four talks. <laughs> <laughs> so which leaves me with the one thing that's impossible to talk about, so um, I'll try. But I will be able to give significantly less in terms of definitions and detail than I usually do. Um, so what I'm going to, the main thing that I'm going to talk about is joint work with Robert Laubitz. But I won't get to that until loads later. So, so let's, let me start with some introduction, some, some motivation. So people are interested in studying quantum groups and in particular in categorifying quantum groups. And so they, so, so we want to study categorifications of quantum groups. and their representation theory. Okay. So, so first, you can do this generically, and this was done by, so they were categorified by Jovanov Lauda and independently OK. So for Q generic, so quantum groups come with this parameter Q, and if Q is generic, these were categorified So what, the, what they do is they find some two category. So in a two category you have objects, and between the objects you have morphisms, but morphisms form a category. And these, so in their categorification they have some additive categories. So, so via some two categories. with additive morphism categories. Okay, and then you can look at the two representations of you, and there are some very well-known two representations. Maybe you can categorify the simple modules for the quantum groups. Um, by looking at some actions on cyclotomic um, Hecke algebra. So, <coughs> so. Um, so the simple module with highest weight lambda, with highest weight lambda is categorified. by the action on an algebra, just write H lambda approach. So these are some cyclotomic Hecker algebras. Okay, what they look like won't be important for this talk. So there won't be any, any dots and any strands and dots or anything in my talk. Um, okay, so this is, this is the generic situation, but then people are also very interested in quantum groups at roots of unity. So what if Q is a peak root of unity? And by that I mean a primitive peak root of unity and P is prime. So this is actually important. We can, I mean, we're, we. People can only do this so far for p equals prime, for, for p equals for p prime. Okay, so this is significantly well. I don't know. I mean, it's it's hard. It's 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 it's, I, it's harder. But um, so what's done is little. So the small quantum group for SL two. So this is one of G and Elias and G, and the whole quantum group for UQSL2. Um, so let me put the dot there as well. Um, but that's not important. 
also by Elias Newton. Okay? And there is a candidate for UQ plus of larger groups here, but they're struggling to prove that it has the right orderly group. So these are categorified via some again by some two categories. But now, um, morphism categories aren't just additive categories, but they have something called a PDG structure, P-differential gradient structure. And I'll explain later what that means. Um, two counts with PDG morphism categories. Okay. And then you can associate, so once you have that, you can associate a certain triangulated category to these, to these um, PDG categories, and this triangulated category will then have the correct Roten group for the for the for the small quantum group and also for the big one. Yeah, so so associate um, a triangulated category about the true representations of those. And also Elias and she um, categorified some, some true representations for the small quantum group, namely if I'm at P root of unity, you have some very nice finite dimensional true representations with pi squared zero up to P minus one. And these are categorified in a similar way by just replacing this cyclotonic Hecker algebra, which in this case by SL2 is a nil Hecker algebra, by something with a differential. So, so for the small quantum group um, and weights, zero up to P minus one. So lambda in here. Um, the simple with highest weight this up. with highest weight lambda is categorified by action <coughs> on so you still have the, the lambda at the end here is just because you're in a particular case where this has a special name the second algebra is just a nil Hecker algebra for SL2. And the del is that you now additionally have this P differential on it. Yeah. And so this is the PDG nil Hecker. Oh. Yeah. Well, this is the PDG nil Hecker. But the difference in having an N here and not over here was just because this was more general. Yeah. So. Whereas here, this is only for SL2. Okay. Okay, so, so this is the motivation. And, well, so when these, these first two categories were studied, um, the, the, the additive ones, so this one and, and the two categories of Zagreb modules and so on, then motivated by that, um, Mazurchuk and I decided we wanted to have some abstract true representation theory. Yeah. And so, so similarly, now we have this, so then Robert and I decided we wanted to have some abstract PDG two representation theory. But before I get to the, the PDG two representation theory, let me remind you of some classical two representation theory, if such a thing exists. So this is mainly joint work with Mazochuk. And in the end, uh, I will mention something um, that involves a uh, slouching jump as well. So, okay, so let me, so, so this bit is a bit, so normally I take way longer for this. On the other hand, most of you are a large, 
portion of you have seen four lectures on these PR2 categories last week. Um, so you're all very familiar with it, so I don't know whether this is going to be super, super boring or way too fast. Um, probably some of it for different people. Okay. Sorry, will you explain how to associate a triangulated category to such a 2 PD um, thing? Very, very roughly. Okay. Later. Yeah. And I can explain it more after the talk if you want. But I, so the thing is, I'm, I sort of work on the enriched level, mostly. Because, the, because once you've associated the triangulated category, the actions aren't so nice anymore. But I'll, I'll say something about that later, and we can talk after the talk. Cool. Um, okay, so a two category C, and this is, this is where, where it starts, because I'm not going to define a two category. So a two category is, it has some objects, and they're going to be called I, J, K, and so on. It has some one morphisms, which are which you can think of as morphisms, and they're going to be F, G, H, and so on, and two morphisms, and they're going to be have little Greek letters. Yeah. So, so what 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 is a two category? So the prototype of a two category is the two category of small categories, where the objects are just all categories, all small categories. And so, by the way, all my whenever I say category, I mean small category. Yeah. Um, so, one morphisms are just functors between categories, and two morphisms are natural transformations. That's the prototype of a category that everybody will have seen. And all other category, all other two categories that I'm interested in, live in there. So, they will be only certain types of categories and only certain types of functors. Usually, all natural transformations. Yeah. So, so that's somehow that's somehow all you need to know really about two categories. There's somehow categories, functors, and natural transformations. Okay. And so, if we have such a two category, then we call it finitary. If so, first of all, we want, and these are these are super super strong. Um, Conditions that Walter and I imposed when we first started with this because we didn't, we had never worked with two categories before, and we found them a bit scary, and so we wanted to have something that was nice and small and controllable. But some of them are not really essential. So the number of objects being finite is not essential. So countable is is works exactly the same thing. I'm not so sure about continuum many objects. Then, if I have two objects, then I can look at my morphism category. So the one morphisms, this contains the one morphisms and two morphisms, so some functors and some natural transformations. And I want this to be equivalent to the category of projective A modules for A, a finite dimensional K algebra, associative K algebra. Now this might look a bit weird but it turns out that this is a good definition. And I'll give an example in a minute. Okay, then, well, we have something called horizontal composition in a two category, which you should think of as composition of functors. Yeah? And somehow, since, since our, our morphism categories are additive categories, k-linear additive categories, it makes sense if we want to compose something in here, so this goes from C, J, K times C, I, J to C, I, K. And since, since this, this is an additive K linear category, this is an additive K linear category, it makes sense for this to be additive and K linear, the by additive and K linear. And then finally, and this is sort of for, for also for convenience more um, than anything else. This is this is like wanting a Gabriel quiver, wanting a basic algebra. We ask that our identity one morphism are indecomposable. If not, we would want to split up the object as because then we would have two eigenpotents and we would want to split up the object into two. Okay. 
So here's my favorite example. And for me, this is super concrete, and I think with this audience, I can probably get away with this, but I've been told that it was actually an abstract example, which I hadn't <laughs> realized. So if A is the product of a bunch of indie composable, so A is an algebra, yeah, but I want to decompose it into blocks, into indie composable algebras. Okay, and so the AI are indie composable, um, meaning they don't have any, any non-trivial central idempotents in decomposable uh, finite dimensional k-algebras. And I always mean associative k-algebras. And so then I can associate it to path 3 ca which I'm sure those who have been to talks uh, of Walter last week have seen. So this has objects 1 up to n. And I identify the object I with the category of projectives over my, um, over my algebra AI. Yeah? And then I have one morphisms, which are given by endo functors.
And then, sorry, I need to clean the board, and this is not good timing. Um, so then we, then we study these equivalence classes, and these are called, so, so this, is a, this is a partial pre-order, so you can form equivalence classes, and these are called cells. And then, somehow it turns out that these cells are very important in the two representation theory because we can associate cell two representations. And in lots of cases, these are actually all, though certainly not always. And there are interesting two representations that are not cell two representations. And currently, it's still a bit of a mystery um, what to do when you have two representations that are not cell. So how to, how to, how to classify them, um, but that's somehow a topic for a different talk. So F and G, are, not, are they assumed at the same source and target here, or is it...? Yes. Oh, okay. Uh, so. No, no, no. No, same same so source. Same so source. H is an endomorphism, or it can go to some other. No, 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 no it can go somewhere else. So, so H, uh, F, and G will in the left order they will have the same source, but not the same target, and and um, the other way around. Okay. So as I said, the equivalence classes. left, right, or two-sided cells. And so, so the, 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 the easy example, CA, so this has two two-sided cells. So you, have, you just have the identity, which is given by tensoring, the, well, in the, it's isomorphic to tensoring with the regular bimodule. So, oh, no, it doesn't have two two-sided cells. Uh, it has n plus one two-sided cells. If I only have one object, it has two. But. So it has one i for i from one to n. And then it has the big cell, which is j which has all, so the indecomposable one morphisms in here. So I mean, I was, I was a bit imprecise here. This, you really define this on indecomposable one morphisms, and in particular, you don't really define it on indecomposable one morphisms, but on isomorphism classes of indecomposable one morphisms. But that's not super So, so equivalence class means you, you first turn this into an equivalence relation, yeah? So you also make it... No, 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 you, take, you can take equivalence classes. So, so if you have f less, left less than or equal to g, and g left less than or equal to f, Ah, then they're okay. in the same equivalence so class. The sub equivalence relation is still okay. No. Yeah. Um, okay, and then in the big cell, you have A, E, all A, E tensor F, A, where E and F are primitive ionicotons. Okay, and note, I'm not, I'm not carrying indices here wrong because the ionicotons will have to choose which algebra it lives in, and then the other code does not appear anymore. Okay, so, so this is the two-sided cell, and then J has left cells. LF, where I fix the right side here, because once I multiply from the left, I will never change this, because I just get some vector space in the middle, and um, something new possibly on the left, but this will never be altered. So this is all AE tensor FA where E is now an idempotent, so primitive. And right cells LE, RE, which are the AE, where I fix the left side. in mind is that this looks like this. 
where these are the, this is sort of Le1 up to Len, and this is Re1 up to Ren. Yeah, and, and in here, if I take the i j position, so E1 up to Ren is now a primitive, a complete set of primitive idempotents. Uh, E1 plus and so on plus Ren is 1, Ei primitive. And then here in the in the ij box, I have A, E, and now I need to get it right, A, E, J, tensor E, I, A. And somehow these are these are very nice because they look like matrix rings. They look like matrices. Yeah? And somehow they, 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 they play a very similar role to just matrix rings in, in um, ordinary representation theory. But again, that's kind of a topic for a different talk. So to left cell, L, we can now associate what we call it cell 2 representation. And again, I mean, normally I would now spend some time explaining what a 2 representation is and writing something on the board, but um, if I want to say anything about PDG, then that's not going to happen. But what you should think of is a 2 representation is. So we said your two category um, is a bunch of categories, a bunch of functors, and a bunch of natural transformations. And now this acts on some categories where your one morphisms act as functors between those categories. So you associate a category to each object in your two category. So a two representation, you send i to some category, then f in cij to some functor from your category, say, say this was ci, ci to cj, and an alpha, which is a two morphism in here to some natural transformation. So that's a two representation. Yeah? And so the cell two representation is you take So first of all, you start with the with the things in your cell, x is in your left cell, yeah, these are some one morphisms. Then you're allowed to apply any one morphism um, from the two category on the left. So you're still inside your two category. And now notice that if I now now I take the additive closure, which means I close under under taking direct sums and direct summands. And then you can see that you can convince yourself that this is closed under the action of C. Yeah, because I've already I've, I've sort of generated a left ideal. Yeah, because I've already I've already multiplied on the left by everything in C that I can multiply with, so it's closed. Yeah? It's like taking taking R A for R a ring and A an element in there. Okay, and so so this is a true representation because I can just keep multiplying on the left by C. And now I can take a quotient of this. By the unique, and this is somehow the uh, lemma that this is unique, maximal ideal, which is C invariant. not containing identities on any of the x's. And I just write for x and l because the, the, because the statement for any x or for all, um, so, for, so it, it doesn't matter what quantifiers you put there because if it contains the identity on one x, it contains all of them. Um, Okay, so this is the cell two representation, and the example for C A L a left cell of J, the big two-sided cell here. So one of my L X, so something something like this. 
Um, then the cell true representation. Oh, and I want you to give that a name. So this is C sub L. Um, and so, so the cell true representation is equivalent to the defining representation. And what do I mean by defining representation? Well, if you look back at my definition of CA, I essentially said I take some categories and I define some functors on there and I define some natural transformations. So I'm defining my true category via a true representation, right? My object I goes to the goes to the category AI approach, my endo functors go to go, go to themselves and my morphisms go to themselves. That's a true representation. And so this is the cell true representation in this case. And that's somehow somehow I don't know, yeah. I guess I guess what that should mean is that cell true representations are a supernatural thing to consider. And very natural, not just supernatural. <laughs> okay, so, so why are cell true representations so good? Cell true representations are good because essentially because they're simple. Because they, by construction, they don't have any c-stable, any non-trivial c-stable invariant ideas. And this is this is what we call simple transitive. And the transitive is kind of a bit superfluous. Um, but we had so many versions of simple that we tried before we came up with this one that they all needed to have different names. So a simple transitive two representation is one that does not have any non-trivial uh, C-stable ideals. And these cell true representations by construction are simple transitive. And what makes them so important is that in lots of cases, they are all simple transitive two representations. So let me write something. So a two representation is called Simple transitive if it has no proper C stable ideas. Okay, and, and so the reason why we believe this is the correct notion of a two representation being simple is because if you use that notion, you get some, some analog of a Jordan Pellet theorem uh, for two representations, which is kind of a good indication of that, a good notion. Um, OK, and, and so some theorem that I just want to mention, although our co-author, Joey, Xiaoting Zhao, um, I think uh, it's Zhang, sorry. It's for some reason, I always, I don't know, I'm, I'm really sorry. Um, she, she presented this last week at the, at the summer school, but I just want to say, so th these are important because, um, so CA is nice in the sense that all simple transitive two representations <coughs> of CA are cell two representations. And so somehow, so we proved this together with, with Joey for, for arbitrary A. Before that, Walter and I had it for A being um, self-injective, um, which is, of course, much weaker, but which was strong enough to, yeah, I mean, there are many, many algebras that are not self-injective, but it was strong enough to already give the application that I now want to mention. So the application, this is, this is from this year, but the application is quite old because it built on a weaker version of this theorem. So the application is that we can build and I don't want to be precise here. But somehow we can build this two category U that Holana Flada and Hookier defined um, from, and now I will see even more big, variants of CA. Where 
So we're, we're essentially, so the, a, the algebras A that appear are these cyclotomic Menhecker algebras. And you, you have some filtration where if you, if you take filtrations of quotients and then kill a bit more that you don't see in the simple transitive two representations, then you, um, you get precisely such a CA. And, and the variance of just means that, so, so inside CA, what are the endomorphisms of the, of the identity? Well, that, those are the, the, the bimodule endomorphisms of the regular bimodule, which is precisely the center of the algebra. Now, the thing is, you could, there's a minimum that you need as an endomorphism ring, but you could kill, you could kill um, some of it, and you could, so you could have a subalgebra of the center, and the same thing would still work, and there is no way of really determining which which subalgebra of the center we need as an endomorphism ring to build these to build these um, two category algebras. But anyway, so the 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 consequence is um, that simple transitive <coughs> two representations of U are self two representations. Is this for any category type? Uh, no. So, so okay. So let me let me be careful here. This is our theorem is only for finite heavy algebras. Um, however, I strongly believe it to be true for any type, and I have PhDs working on it, but <laughs> that's not done. Um, but but essentially essentially the problem is that for if if I go outside finite type, so I should maybe say here. Hmm? Doing the type. Yeah. Um, so, so if I go outside, then I can't create any finitary two categories, but they will be something weaker than that. So they will have bigger morphism spaces, but will somehow have finite, finite dimension. So graded, but they will be graded finite dimensional, and I believe that will be enough that the same things will go through, but as I said, that's not, not really done. So that's work in progress. And, and these are, are precisely the actions on these cyclotomic algebras. <coughs> yeah, so so the, the, the two representations that people constructed are cell two representations. And as a corollary of this theorem, um, we get that these exhaust also the transitive two representations, which is good. Really, if the uh, two Katsumi algebra had more things, more two more simple transitive two representations than the, the on the then you can see on the algebra effect level. Okay, so this is sort of a recap of, of finitary two representation theory. So now let's switch gear and go to PDG categories. to DG, and if you stick the signs in, the correct signs, then you have a theory of DG2 representation theory. Okay, so what's a PDG category? So let's not talk about two categories at first, but just stick to categories. Okay. So a PDG category is an additive category.
enriched over, and I'll say, I'll say some more about what that means, but um, it's enriched over graded modules of H for H. So H is just a truncated polynomial ring, but very suggestively, I'll call it, I'll call the variable del. So H is K del, K adjoint del modulo del to the P, and K has characteristic P. Okay, so, so what does that mean? I have, my, I have my objects and I have my morphism spaces, and my morphism spaces are just vector spaces, but they also have an action of this algebra, meaning I have something that I have an endomorphism on my on my morphism space that whose p power is zero, and this is a symmetric monoidal category, so I can I can somehow compose morphisms and then I get some Leibniz rule. Yeah, so I get something like del f g is del f g plus f del g. And the beauty again is because in, because we're in characteristic p, we don't have to worry about signs, so that makes things much easier. Okay, so. Then once I have this category, um, I can define Zc, which are somehow the zero cycles, is the category with the same objects as C. But now I have HOM in Zc from an object X to Y, to an object Y. This is just those F. which have degree zero. So I said this is graded H modules, yeah, so everything has a degree. Um, so degree of F is zero, and um, del of F is zero. Okay, those are, those are my cycles. And, yeah, okay, let me give you an, an the E, oh, I forgot, I forgot all. Um, anyway, I'll continue this one. So the smallest example is what we call K mod H, where the objects are graded H modules. And the morphisms are all, um, so HOM and K mod H from B to W. It's just all linear maps. And the differential is just given by del cert f minus f cert del. Yeah? So this is somehow a very natural example. And if you take z of that, uh, <coughs> then you get h mod back. Because then you only allow maps of degree zero that commute with the action. Yeah. Okay. And so if we want to talk about PDG stuff, we always need to distinguish between so so you have lots of, in the category you have lots of lots of properties that are determined by morphisms, like something being indecomposable, meaning it does it has no non-trivial eigenpotence, or um, something being or, or you have isomorphisms and you always have to specify whether that whether these isomorphisms or these indecomposables live in Z of the category or in the whole category. And so we introduce some notation and we distinguish <coughs> K isomorphisms, K indecomposable, etc. Or PDG isomorphisms, PDG indecomposables, etc. where if I say k, this means I can take any morphism. If, so any morphism is allowed. And here I just have only, only morphisms in Zc. OK, and then, then we need a PDG functor. Later on, so F from C to C prime. 
spine um, is a hyalinear additive function. such that the assignment of morphism spaces, so if I go from HOM CXY to HOM C prime, FX FY, is a degree zero morphism operated H module. So this has to be of degree zero and it has to commute with the differential. about a proj. Now the, the correct analog of here would be to talk about cofibrant A modules, but we want to uh, cofibrant modules over this category, but we want to actually have small categories, so we define some analog of twisted complexes. So for a PDG category, we define, and if you haven't seen twisted complexes by, by um, uh, von Neumann Kapanov, um, this would look like a, like a completely idiotic and crazy definition. But, so this, we call it the overline, and this has objects, which are direct sums of objects in C, finite direct sums. Oh, let me stick to my notation index with S, otherwise I'll just get in Together with some map alpha, so some matrix, where so, so the x, i, r, and c, <coughs> and alpha is an m by m matrix of morphism. And now, Bonner and Kapanov gave a very nice close formula for what this needs to do, and this is not so trivial um, for characteristic, so for, for PDG, but such that the best we can do is spell off the identity plus alpha star um, is a p-differential. I mean, we can give partial um, partial conditions, so necessar uh, necessary conditions, but not sufficient conditions. But but this is now something that some some endomorphism of this space. And it needs to be a p differential. Yeah, meaning it needs to um, it needs to have p power zero, and it needs to satisfy the Lyapunov rule with respect to composition. Okay, and so so this now morphisms morphisms in here are just direct sums of all are just morphisms of the direct sums. So from uh, C overline x y is the direct sum over of ij home c x i y j and this taking all morphisms means i now can enrich this and have a p differential on those by defining del in c overline of f is component wise differential taken in c plus and then the commutator with these these matrices Alpha y f minus f uh, alpha x. Yes, yeah, so I mean the, the, the precise formulas here are not important. What's important is that we construct some 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 larger category where the the where we have some matrix encoding some differential how they how these bits are glued together, and this is again enriched and a PDG category. Yeah. And so so the reason why this category this fifth category is because this should be thought of as a PDG enhancement. Of, 
the compact derived category, which I also don't want to define, um, but which is the category that is the correct triangulated category to take the broadly equal form. So, so, with, with, so one, one way of defining this is via this PDG enhancement. So if you take, and so you asked about this triangulated category, if you take the C over line, you take the cycles in it, just set of it, and then you, you can define nil, um, not more topic morphisms, you portion those out, and that's the correct triangulated category. That is a triangulated category, and that's the one that they that they need to take the broken equal off to get the correct case. But you had a two PDG category. Yeah, ah, okay, so then, then you essentially take it category wise. Yeah, you look at the C IJ. Yeah, yeah. Yeah? Is this some kind of concrete way to think about the tabulated closure of the PDG unit unbelief? Or it has nothing to do with it? About the what, sorry? The unit yeah, yeah, yeah. This is the closure of the unit of the Yes, more or less. So, can you say in which category the good people lives? In which category? Yeah, you don't want to define what it is. Oh, so, 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 so they take the growth groups of this of, of the compact derived categories of the individual morphism categories. Okay. And, and this compact derived category is equivalent to taking cycles of this modulo, not homotopic. Is it hard to be getting huh? yeah. Yes. Yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah. Except, except you have to be slightly careful because you have a p differential. Yeah. yeah. So, so this is why I also put PDG enhancement in, in quotation marks because if you specialize to p equal to two, then you have DG enhancement on the nodes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You have DG categories. Um, so the notion of quasi isomorphism which appears here is isomorphism on all the possible homology groups that can make sense of. Yeah. For all um, the complexes. I'm, I'm not talking. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. But but I, I really I prefer to, th to think of it as a portion of Z this by, by non-homotopic morphisms, which are then somehow the ones that are at the sockles of the of the um, morphism spaces uh, of the, the the H modules inside the morphism spaces. Okay, so now I need one crucial definition before we can move on to two categories for the last eight minutes, or once I've given my definition, seven minutes. So C is strongly finitary. If so, the first thing that I want is I want finite dimensional morphism spaces. Um, secondly, I want the number of PDG isomorphism classes of indecomposables of k in the composables to be finite. It is finite. And here I mean up to shift and iso. Oh, isomorphic classes I already have, but up to shift. Okay. And so, so, so this, these are sort of not super strong restrictions, but the next one is, is really a strong restriction. If I take E to be the additive, just additive closure of um, the K in the composables, so this is the full additive closure, um, of K in the composables. So this is morphisms that genuinely don't have any non-trivial idempotence, not only in degree zero and so on. Um, then I have I can take B over line, and that will of course embed into C over line, but this should be an equivalence. And this is this is a really, really strong condition. But unfortunately it seems necessary to do anything meaningful. Okay.
now the final chapter, which is PDG2 representation theory. Okay, so first of all, what's a PDG2 category? Well, it's a two category where the individual morphism categories are PDG categories. So a PDG category C is a two category such that for every I and J in C of any two objects, C, I, and J is a PDG category. So you mean PDG2 category, right? Yes, thank you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> is a no, no, I mean what the thing you're defining PDG two category. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, sorry, yes, I put the PDG in the wrong place. I just saw that there was something PDG two category. Yes, thank you. Uh, <laughs> doing the same thing as Joe. I'm getting into the middle of time when I'm rushing. So it's a PDG um, category and horizontal composition. is a bi-additive PDG counter. And we call C strongly unitary if every CIJ is. representations, construct cell two representations 
And I won't, unfortunately, won't have time to say how. But similarly, so it's, it is more complicated because we have this crazy overline construction and we have to be able to close under everything that appears in the overline construction and so on. Um, similarly, but more complicated. So the precise construction is in our paper. Um, and then, and now I'm sorry, I do need to erase. Do you derive these tensor products in your uh, context? Or? Um. When I, the, the no, because somehow, because somehow we always work with things that are more fibrin. Somehow. Okay. Yeah, because we, we work with these overline categories, which are more fibrin things, and so we don't need to derive anything. So can I think of C overline as the cofibrin replacement of C? Or? Yeah. So it's, 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 it's equivalent to the category, uh, sorry, I should have said that. It's equivalent to the category of cofibrin modules over, over C. So the theorem is that for CA, which is, I mean, this is, this is a much weaker theorem than things we can do in the finitary world. So we, first of all, we need that the radical of this category is closed under the differential. Then the cell two representation um, okay, CL of a left cell L in J, so the, the, so we have the same thing that we have one big cell as in the underlying finitary world is the natural, so it is given by C L I of I is A I with the natural action. And what we can get from that is that the two representations that Elias and Chi constructed of categorified UQSO2 in Elias and Chi's paper are cell two representations. 